Hello, and welcome to today's episode of the Authentic Uprising podcast. I'm your host, Jill Simons, and I'm so excited to grow in the radical art of standing in what God says about you with you today. The show is a place where we pour into the sense of who God is, who we are, and how we can live more in the freedom that He has for us every single day. and welcome to the Authentic Uprising podcast. As always, I'm your host, Jill Simons. And today my baby has evicted me from my office. So I am recording in the shop today instead of in my normal space in my office where Jack is blissfully sleeping. So I'm so excited to talk today about something that goes along with blissful sleep is the idea of finding freedom from anxiety where we can actually enter into really the joy, the rest, and the peace that God tells us about in his word that he invites us into, but it's not always a linear path to get there. And there are lots of reasons that people might be finding anxiety, really having a strong grip on their life. So to speak some truth into this, I have today with me, Ann Taylor McNeese, who is a licensed marriage and family counselor. That's going to be helping us kind of figure out all of the different threads that go into anxiety, whether it's something that we're just experiencing because of our personality, whether it's something that we maybe need to get some more help for and where our faith fits into all of it. So Ann Taylor, thank you so much for being here with me today. Hi, Jill. Thanks for having me. So why don't you share with us to get started a little bit about why you became a marriage and family counselor? Yeah, actually, I, I, experienced depression myself when I was a senior in high school and I went off to college and I thought I was going to become an OBGYN and I was really interested in medicine and then uh, God took me on a different path towards psychology. I've always been really interested in this intersection between psychology and theology and knowing that God wants us to be healthy and whole. And so how do we get there? And I believe part of it is our, our walk in our faith, but that we also have tools that are um, provided through people and through science and that we can use all of those to help us walk this life that God has planned for us. I love that. I love being alive at this specific time in history Mm -hmm. where we do have so much of the science really informing and supporting a lot of what our faith has always taught, but, but then there being kind of a new richness that we're uncovering in the modern world, whether it's in the fields of psychology or in neuroscience or in other places where there is that intersection with theology, like you were saying. And so as you do your sessions with um, your clients, you see a lot of people with anxiety, correct? Yeah, it's kind of one of those areas I didn't plan to get specialized in, but a long time ago when I was an intern and I was working at a community mental health agency, I noticed on my caseload that almost everybody had an anxiety disorder. And so that was at a time I was an intern. I didn't get a lot of say over who I was going to see. So I walked up to the front desk and I said, hey, how come everybody on my caseload has anxiety? And the person at the front desk said, well, sometimes people just call and I feel like they just need Anne. And so, <laughs> so part of my personality is I I'm pretty calm. I'm just calm. I'm laid back. And like I said, I have struggled with depression, but I I tend to run like on a lower frequency than a lot of other people. And so often people with anxiety come to meet with me because they can just take it a notch down when they're in my presence and they can leave feeling a little bit more equipped to handle their life. And of course, I use all the techniques and uh, we use uh, prayer and scripture as well as all the clinical counseling techniques. But some something about just who I am and how God designed me um, prepares me specifically for working with people with anxiety. I love that so much. I am such a deep, deep believer in like just being so perfectly equipped for the specific way that God wants us to speak life into his church and to build his church. Right. And And so as we get started, I would love to kind of begin with a definition of terms for people that, you know, anxiety, the word anxiety gets thrown around just a massive Mm -hmm. amount myself as well. I know I'm guilty of it to 
it's maybe say anxiety when it's something that's just a momentary experience that I'm having versus it as a disorder. Um, so how would you help people kind of get their head around what is momentary anxiety versus situational anxiety versus actually having an anxiety disorder? Yeah. So anxiety as a clinical disorder, there's a lot of different titles and terms that you can use generalized anxiety or specific phobias, everything from OCD to social anxiety, like they're all within this category of anxiety disorders. But the main thing being when you have a lot of worries all the time about all the stuff. So if you find yourself worrying for a good part of the day about multiple different types of um, worries, concerns, things that might happen, things that have happened, uh, and you do that all the time about a lot of different stuff, that's what we call generalized anxiety. But it's not just the worry, it's also something that's present in your body. So with, with a clinical anxiety, you might feel a shortness of breath or a rapid heartbeat. You might get a stomach ache or a headache. You might get clammy palms or your, your forehead might start sweating. And so then you have this kind of physical response to the worry that you're having. And really that goes back to the way God designed us to have that fight or flight response. What happens in animals to keep them safe so that they can run away from a predator or fight a predator. In humans, that response just never gets turned off. And so we end up getting ulcers, you know? Um, so that that's when it is clinical, but I would say it's very normal for us to worry about just normal things in life and not to have those things take over because there wouldn't be scripture about this if it wasn't a normal part of human life. So in Matthew, when, when Jesus says, don't worry about tomorrow, tomorrow has enough worries of its own or, or look at the lilies of the field, you know, and he's telling us we're not worrying about these things because he knows that's our nature to worry because we think we're in control. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And that we need to control that. And if we start allowing God to have some of that control, we can say, okay, I can worry in this moment, but then I'm going to submit that over to God and, and not let that kind of run my day, run my life. And that's when it starts to become that physical expression of that worry. Then it becomes part, it, it starts to really run your life because you have it every day and it prevents you from going to do the things that you want to do or see the people that you want to see. Um, and that's when it starts to become more of that clinical issue. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense because, um, when you, when there's kind of that, would you say that the defining feature versus like for kind of a momentary worry versus a anxiety disorder would be in the like prevalence and how much it defines your daily activities. Yeah, as a therapist, what we're always looking for is what's the level of dysfunction. So if it's disrupting your life in a way that is causing you, like I said, either now we have an ulcer or I'm getting headaches every day, or I'm not able to go and do the things that I'd like to do because I'm just too scared, I'm too worried. Like th when that disruption happens, that's when we see that it's at a clinical level. Okay. Yeah. That is helpful. That makes a lot of sense. And so how do you, you said you walk through people, um, walk through these struggles with people using, you know, prayer and scripture as well as your clinical tools. And so really when, when people are already prone to anxiety, whether it's gotten to the level of becoming an anxiety disorder, or it's simply something that's kind of, um, inherent in their personality, they're a more, you know, nervous, anxious person. How how do you counsel them to kind of face those worries as they go through their day in light of their faith? So I will give them both the, those clinical tools that anybody can use, whether you have faith in Jesus or not. But I will always say, because my, my big thing is that integration of faith and psychology gives us a superpower, you know, uh, once you have all those tools in place and you're also um, meditating on the scripture, spending time with God, spending time in the presence of a supportive community of other believers, you know, th those things are all going to take those basic clinical practices to the next level. And so depending on what the person 
coming in to see me is like and what their faith experience has been like and what they're asking for, I might start at one place or the other. I might start at like, what, what does God have to say about this? Let's look in the scripture or let's do some spiritual disciplines around like silence, solitude, prayer, uh, even community, like things like that might be what that person needs. But the person might also just need grounding techniques and breathing and relaxation and uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Like that might be where they need to start because they, a lot of people have their spiritual lives dialed in. They know what they're doing, but this other thing still keeps getting in the way. And that's where they need the help. I think that that is really common actually, where there's people who have a deep and meaningful relationship with Jesus and are very engaged in their church community and things like that, that, that still struggle with Mm -hmm. anxiety, even to the level of an anxiety disorder. And there can be shame around that, that they experience because of that. And so how do you speak into kind of that specific shame that people experience when worry is still a part of their life, despite the depth and importance of their faith? Yeah. Well, one thing to know, and you mentioned neuroscience earlier, is that there is actual anatomy in your brain that when you have these thoughts over and over again, it actually changes the way your brain is shaped and the way your brain is wired and how thoughts flow from one one cell to the next cell, you know. And so if you've continued to have worries over a period of time, it has changed your brain into being the brain of somebody with anxiety. And so if we look at that or whether or not that is the case or that happened through trauma or that happened because you have more of like a biological predisposition, it's something that's been passed down in your family. Like this, we're looking at this as more of like a biological illness. And so in the same way that I don't shame somebody who has diabetes for needing to take insulin or somebody who has cancer for needing to go through a chemo treatment, like I'm not going to shame somebody that has anxiety because worrying about it like we said there there's that worry that jesus expects all of us to have and he's given us some scripture to help deal with that and then there's this other level where it's it's not going away i can't shake it that's that's something i've experienced like i mentioned i i tend to run on a low frequency i've struggled with depression here and there throughout my adult life and I don't typically experience anxiety. It's not part of my normal makeup. However, there have been certain situations that have caused a lot of anxiety, like setting up my private practice. I had no clue what I was doing and there was nobody to walk through it with me. And so I had a lot of anxiety during that season. Um, Recently, and just two months ago, I actually had it rescheduled this interview because I had a stroke that was totally unexpected in November. And so I went to the doctor and they said, you have no risk factors. We don't know why this happened. And so because of that, there's nothing I could do behaviorally to change my stroke risk in the future or to know if this was ever going to happen again or if I was going to leave my kids without a mother, you know. And so right now in my life, I have a little bit more anxiety that brews under the surface just because of that situation but i I, i'd say that to point out that there's situational anxiety that doesn't mean you have an anxiety disorder nevertheless you might still need help with that season of life yeah that is really helpful because i love what you said about how um Uh, really just about the scriptures and Jesus giving us those verses about worry coming at it from the perspective of Jesus gave us these because he expected us to worry versus coming at it from like, again, shaming, like we shouldn't need to worry. We shouldn't be worried because, you know, Jesus said not to where we just realized that this is because he knew we would need the tools, the actual scripture to meditate on and to move through this because it's an, it's expected. And I think that that takes a lot of the like scariness weight off of it. If that's become like an additional source of anxiety that you have anxiety uh, is to just realize that there's a level of expectation that there's going to be, you know, some level of worry in life and situations like you mentioned, you know, pop up for people all the time. There's, there's, we don't control everything. And so there's always things that are X factors in our lives, no matter what the other, you know, what other things are going on in your life. And, um, that's helpful too, to mention getting kind of that temporary help to walk through things. Is that, 
um, common that you see people for kind of a short period, or is it typically a long relationship where you're seeing people? I would say I have both. There's some people that have chronic need. And a lot of times that comes because there's been a lot of trauma in their past. And that stuff just doesn't get unraveled quickly. They've built up all of these defenses or ways of living their life that have just got them through to however old they are. And that's not going to be untangled quickly. And so it's a long process. But then there's other people who like maybe something like a job loss happened where you know, still have all your work skills, you still have all, you know, your connections and stuff, but this was really disappointing for a time. And you have a lot of anxiety about how you're going to make ends meet for the time. And so you might work with a counselor for a couple of months just to kind of get through that time. Does yeah. that make sense? Oh yeah, absolutely. And I think that I have also like prior to having one of my children had a season like you're talking about with anxiety where there was a lot around the pregnancy and things like that. And so I've experienced that myself in my own life. Um, and as we, we always like to talk about freedom here. And I think that it's important to balance kind of the two things, like talking about freedom, like it really is real. Like Jesus really does change things, not just, you know, that we get to be with him in heaven someday and that's better, but actually there's something very real that we can step into that's better now. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times people have struggled to have these conversations because there's pushback around like, well, um, you know, I have, I have this illness. I have these, um, this, some, you know, chronic condition, whatever the case might be. It doesn't seem like this is true for me. And so Um, how would you kind of walk with people or, or just counsel them briefly in terms of sort of holding both things at the same time? Like Jesus really does come into our daily lives now and change things for the better. And also we don't live in a perfect world and there, you know, things going on in your life and, um, your, the evidence of your life isn't necessarily the be all end all, if that Mm -hmm. makes, if that makes Mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. I I think we hold that, uh, yes, we believe that God can do a miracle in this situation or he can redeem any situation. And if you see, like, let's say, like, take an addict that's, you know, thrown away their life on drugs or something like that, and then you see them come to a turning point and turn their life around and and they give glory to God for that. Like if that can happen in like our substance use communities or even I've heard of that or for people with like brain tumors or people with like impossible marriages, like infidelity or uh, God turns around these situations on a regular basis. That's what he does. And so we can believe that while also knowing that may or may not be the situation for ourselves. And sometimes we might get a little bit disappointed that why does that person get the miracle, but I still have the struggle. And that comes back to the belief that whatever the struggle is that you're in, that God has a plan for that struggle as well. And in redeeming that struggle, he is redeeming you. He's sanctifying you. And so if I have to go through depression, or if you have to go through anxiety, or like I had to have a a thing in my brain, (laughs) you know, like that isn't going to be part of the story that God has planned for me and that it's going to be for my good and also for my ministry to other people. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's one of those places, like many places where comparison is the thief of joy is kind of the thing that is so frequently said because it is so common to compare our journeys and our stories and things like that. And to be like, I kind of like to have her story over there. That seems like a much like more level playing field kind of story. Um, and so how to have you seen people maybe walk through anxiety, maybe still be in chronic anxiety and have that be something that, that informs and also deepens their faith life or are those things that seem to be mutually exclusive? No, actually I'm going to compare it with this different analogy because um, one of my best friends has celiac disease. And so she's not able to eat anything with gluten. Dairy also bothers her. Sugar bothers her and um, corn 
So if you take out those categories, it's like, what, what do you eat? Like basically meat and vegetables. Right. And so for a long time, I felt like, wow, I've really struggled with getting my eating under control and managing my weight and things like that. And if I just had a disease like celiac, then I would have to, I wouldn't have a choice. You know, I would either feel terrible all the time. It would lead me toward, towards more like medical expenses and things like that, or I would clean up my eating, you know? And I think that this is somewhat true in terms of our spiritual life. So a lot of us would like to be closer to God and we'd like to have a more active prayer life and we'd like to study the Bible without getting distracted. And, you know, we'd like all of these things, but we think, uh, I, I'm, I am distracted or I have too many things to do, or it's not that serious or whatever. But for people who have anxiety, whether that's just on the everyday worry level or on the clinical level of an anxiety disorder. It's one of those things that you can allow to push you towards the um, sanctification that God has for you. I and mean, use that word again, because that's that process of God taking you from this like dirty, broken human into making him the the creation, making you the creation that he planned for you to be long ago. He planned good works for you to do, right? It says in Ephesians. So if we allow anxiety or depression or or a physical ailment or whatever it is to push us towards that, then we get the benefit. I mean, God, of course, God wants to spend time with us, but who's really receiving the reward in this? It's us. Yeah. That's a beautiful analogy, actually, because I have had similar thoughts where, you know, my son has a very specialized diet because of his autism. Um, and I manage that for him, mm -hmm. you know, and so that's what that's the way I look at it is, man, I wish someone would just like come do this for me <laughs> like so that I could just eat what is sat in front of me. Um, I miss that stage of my life, honestly. And um, and using kind of the vehicle of the cards you've been dealt really mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you, you know, you look at the parable of the talents and it's kind of kind of doesn't matter that much, whether it's a positive thing or a negative thing that is put in front of you, because it's all in how you surrender it mm -hmm. to the story that God is writing. Yeah. Like, can you be faithful in both like those really positive things, like your business is booming, or you've got so many new listeners to your podcast, or, you know, like, are you going to be faithful in that? Are you going to be faithful when your child's going through a really difficult diagnosis or, you know, your husband lost his job or whatever those situations may be? Yeah, absolutely. And so it's always an invitation, right? That's one of the, our favorite things to say here is like to be real with Jesus. And so when it is something like anxiety mm -hmm. or worry, that is a daily, maybe even crushing part of your life, mm -hmm. it's so important to take that to him and surrender. But what I want to end with here is talking a little bit about, um, inviting people to kind of discern where that line is of this is something that is inviting me into deeper relationship with Jesus, which it all is, but there's also sort of that line where, but I also shouldn't continue doing this solo on my mm -hmm. own without, um, whether it's a doctor or a therapist or another knowledgeable person walking mm -hmm. with me. Yeah. And I, I just want to first address that there's a lot of obstacles for Christians, especially Christian women in the church about what we think about anxiety and worry. And like we mentioned these other verses already today in this conversation, and you may have had somebody say something to you or give you the impression that because you have worry and because you haven't given your worries over to Jesus, that that makes you a sinner and not as good of a Christian. And if that is the belief that you have, that will cause you to not talk to anybody about it, not admit it to your Christian community, not seek out help. And so we just want to normalize here in this conversation that this is something that we all deal with, whether we admit it or not. And I always like to talk about therapy in terms of like a uh, tune up for your car. So obviously if the car breaks down, it won't run anymore. We're going to take it in to get repaired. 
but also it, we need to take it in on a regular basis to have the oil change and to have tune-ups. And if we don't do that, we're headed for more catastrophic breakdowns in the future. <laughs> and so I like to say, whether that's with your marriage or just your own personal journey, like go see a therapist, like develop a relationship with a counselor that you can kind of just have on standby. It's almost like when somebody has like a lawyer on retainer, you know, like you don't have to pay that person any money to have them on retainer for you when you need that check-in, but it's not a bad idea just to have that as a regular practice. Like you go for a physical exam with your doctor, just go for a checkup with a counselor just to see how everything is going. So that when, and if you do have a breakdown moment, I'm not talking about like a nervous breakdown, but when things aren't going well, um, that you have somebody on hand to do that with you. And then just to make that more normal in your community. If you're in a church situation where people don't talk about therapy or medications or mental health issues, like you be the person that starts saying, oh, I went to see my counselor and I feel so good now, or I got these things that I need to work on. And I'm so excited that somebody's walking with me so that I don't have to do that alone. You know, just make that more normal. And if that's something that you're like, well, I wish I could do that, but I don't even know where to start with that. I just want to invite you I, on one of the very first episodes of my podcast is about how do you find a Christian counselor? And I walk through step by step, how to find that person, how to know if they're going to be a good fit, how to pay for it, all of that stuff. So I'll, I'll send you the link so you can add that. <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely include that in the show notes so that everyone can listen to that episode. Yeah. Thank you. Is there um, guidance that you want to share on kind of that? Because um, you were mentioning, you know, being able to build a relationship with someone, which I really love, because then when it is more intense, the last thing you want to be doing is trying to like inform someone about your life for the mm -hmm. first time ever. Um, but if someone is like, you know, my husband only goes to the doctor, not for his yearly physical, <laughs> but for the tune up, you know, when, when the oil is really needs to be changed. Um, is there kind of a point at which maybe even if there's someone in someone's family where there's, you know, not necessarily taking initiative to seek something out, where's the point where you really are like, this needs to be a priority to um, get in now because we are headed towards that kind of engine failure situation. I think if you're even having that thought, then that's probably the time, you know, and the thing about being concerned about somebody else in your family or your friend circle, like you can't, you can, you can normalize that for that person. You can say, this is what I'm gaining by doing this for my own well-being but it's very hard to convince somebody else to go to therapy if they think they're the only one or that it's not that bad or so really i like to say lead by example in this even if you think there's not anything that that that's really that wrong with you like meet with somebody even if it's not a if you're if you're not having like an active mental health thing and you just want to meet with somebody from the church staff or um, somebody who's been a mentor to you before, like just normalize having those kinds of conversations where we bring our real authentic self, all the dirty parts, let somebody else look at it and weigh in a little bit. I love that. Yeah. That's, I have a woman that I speak with specifically about my spiritual life on a regular basis. And that is similar to what you're saying, where it's really just about being as real as possible and, you know, letting her also kind of, um, just check based on, cause she's older than me, just kind of based on her life experiences is that, you know, seem to track with how God speaks to me and yeah. things like that. And so, mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Ann Taylor, for being here with us today. Um, we have um, links to everything that Ann is putting out right now in the show notes, in the YouTube description. So check that out and um, we will see you again next Tuesday. Thanks for being here with us today. Thanks, Jill. 
Thank you so much for joining me on today's episode of the Authentic Uprising podcast. It is always a joy to be with you. I encourage you to subscribe to our podcast, subscribe to our YouTube channel, um, whichever place you most prefer or do it all if that is what floats your boat. We would love to continue to get to know you better and grow in relationship with you. And so I encourage you to check out the links in both our show notes and our YouTube description that tell you more about where you can connect with us elsewhere. The two big things we have going on besides the podcast is our shop that is full of reminders of who you are in God, helping you to really grow in that radical art of standing in who you are and giving gifts that help others to do the same. The other big thing we have going on is the Uprising Academy. This is all of our formation um, programs, workshops, retreats. Everything is available virtually and on demand where you can sign up and continue to learn more about radically standing in what God says about you, especially if you are in a place in your life where you are not being fed the way that you long to be fed whether it's in your community, whether it's at your church, whatever it is, there is more for you and we can absolutely walk with you into it through the Uprising Academy. All those links are in our show notes. And if you enjoyed this episode, I encourage you to leave a review. Reviews are the number one way that we help get in front of new faces, new people that are able to be touched by the radical art of standing and what God says about us. I love you. I'm praying for you. I hope you have an amazing week.